Hi guys, so we've been talking about water transport. You looked at your whole diffusion and osmosis lab and how different types of transport can impact a cell. Now we're going to take that and look at it on a much larger level and see how does water transport help you throughout your entire body. We're going to look at that by looking at how is your water balanced in your body and how then is water used to help remove nitrogenous waste from your body. Okay. This uh, PowerPoint refers to chapter 44 in your textbook. All right, so you are a multicellular creature. So you've got to be able to function as a multicellular creature. You cannot simply diffuse materials in and out of each cell. To try to get from cell to cell to cell to cell, it would take way too long to get any of the good stuff in or any of the bad stuff out. Okay. So diffusion is too slow for a multicellular system. You need a multicellular organism. You need to have all these different systems, and here's kind of a basic body plan of an organism with systems. And these systems are going to help move materials around and get them where they need to be. So you see that your circulatory system moves everything all around, and it's going to take in good stuff, nutrients from your digestive system, and help get rid of some of your metabolic waste. What is metabolic waste? It's the waste that comes out of your cells, and the majority of that waste is going to be nitrogen-containing waste or nit nitrogenous waste. And where do you get rid of that waste? Through your urine. Okay. So to get nutrients and things through your body, um, you can't do straight diffusion, you have to have a circulatory system. To remove the wastes out of your body, you have an excretory system, okay? All right, so let's talk about how is water balanced in um, creatures that live in the water, okay? This is not humans, but these are other kinds of animals, and water balance is really, really important. You wouldn't want to fish to be swimming along and all of a sudden water all goes rushing into their body and they explode. That would be bad. So water balance for a freshwater fish. Well, think about it. The fish itself is going to be, um, the surrounding solution is hypotonic. I apologize. The surrounding solution is hypotonic. There are less solutes in the lake than there are in the fish because the fish is full of um, salts and nutrients and all these things. So water is going to want to flow in to the fish and then salt from the fish's body are going to be lost to the water at all times. That's diffusion and osmosis. Okay, So how does a fish deal with this? They deal with this by peeing like crazy. Yes, you go into a lake, it's full of fish pee. You're fine, it's okay, but it's full of fish pee. So fish are constantly in fresh water, peeing like crazy, and they're peeing out a lot and lot and lot of excess water. So water comes into to their body, it's constantly coming in, it's moving in through osmosis, it's coming in through all their food as they drink, and then they're peeing out dilute urine all the time. Okay. A saltwater fish has the opposite problem. Their solution, they're living in a hypertonic solution. All that salt makes the water um, have way more solutes than their body does. So they're constantly losing water from their cells to their environment. So how do they deal with that? Well, they drink in water as much as they can. They eat a lot of plants and things like that that have high water con content. And then they excrete or they urinate or they pee small amounts. And that those small amounts are really, really, really concentrated. Lots and lots of solutes going out, very little water going out. So they're doing everything that they can to conserve water loss from their body. Now, we are land creatures. We live in a dry environment. So we have to keep all the water that we can. We also have to do everything we can to conserve our salts. So we have this balance we have to do of making sure we have enough salt and enough water. Okay? You're always losing water every time you breathe. Every breath, a little bit of water um, is going to evaporate out of your respiratory system and leave your body. Okay? And you could lose your life, literally lose your life, searching for water. Okay. As your cells do work, they produce waste. They have lots of different things that they that they do. So as we digest our food, carbohydrates, remember, are made up of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. So we get rid of that as CO2 and as water. Easy. CO2, breathe it out, water, pee it out. Lipids, same thing. Okay. Proteins, though, have nitrogen in them. Nucleic acids have nitrogen in them. How do we get rid of that nitrogen? Okay. That part can go out of CO2 and water. But the actual NH2, you've got to find some way of dealing with it. If you remember, NH2 is toxic to your body. 
okay? It's ammonia, and it's toxic to your body. It cannot stay in your body. If it does, it will kill you. So you've got to find some way of getting it out and getting it out quickly. Okay? You literally poison yourself every time you eat proteins. It's okay, you can deal with it, but if, if something goes wrong with the system we're going to talk about, you will poison yourself. All right. Okay, different types of organisms have different ways of dealing with our nitrogenous waste. Ammonia, NH3, is extremely toxic, and it's very soluble in water, so it dissolves into water really, really easily. It's going to easily cross membranes, okay? So you've got to get it diluted and get rid of it really, really fast. How do you get rid of nitrogenous waste? Depends on who you are, where you live, and your evolutionary relationship to other creatures. So how you've evolved to deal with this stuff. So let's look at some stuff. It's going to be different if you're aquatic versus terrestrial versus an egg layer. Okay. All right. So aquatic organisms, um, especially like freshwater organisms, can afford to lose water like crazy. Remember I just said that freshwater fish are just peeing all the time? So there's no point in spending energy to convert ammonia to a less toxic substance because they have tons of water to dilute it. So they don't waste energy on it. Okay. Terrestrial mammals, though, need to cons or terrestrial animals in general need to conserve water as much as possible. So they are going to convert their ammonia. They're going to use the energy, um, deal with that loss of energy to convert ammonia into something called urea. Okay, and then but then terrestrial egg layers, they need to conserve water, but then they also have to protect the embryo that's inside their eggs. Birds and, and reptiles lay their young in a hard-shelled egg. Okay, so there is no exchange with the environment with that egg. However, as that embryo is growing, it's producing nitrogenous waste. So all that nitrogenous waste has to stay in the egg with the embryo. So they've got to convert their ammonia into something really, really, really untoxic. And they convert it into something called uric acid. All right, let's look at all these a little bit more. Okay, so again, freshwater fish have tons and tons of excess water. They um, can use that excess water to dilute the ammonia and pee it out as ammonia. No point in wasting any energy in converting it. And then they also are going to diffuse ammonia directly out of their gills and through any moist membrane, through the mouth um, and at the excretory um, spot and at the anus, all those places. Okay. Land mammals, though, you've got to conserve water, so you've got to take energy to convert ammonia into something less toxic. And that less toxic molecule is called urea. It's a larger molecule. It's not as soluble in water, so it doesn't pass from cell to cell as easily. Okay? And you can get two amine groups into one urea molecule, so you can get rid of it even a little bit faster. Okay? You produce your urea in your liver. Okay, does cost energy to synthesize, but it's worth it. And then at your kidney, you're going to filter the urea out of your blood, get it into um, your urine, and excrete it from the body. Okay. Okay, urine is going to be very concentrated with urea, and then excess things that might be in your body. All right. Egg layers, like we said, hard shelled egg. Everything that that embryo produces over the course of its development all has to stay in there. So if it's in there with ammonia or urea, the embryo is going to be poisoned by those toxic substances. So therefore, <laughs> the egg has an itty bitty living space. Um, uh, they use the energy, birds and reptiles use energy, lots of energy, to convert their ammonia into an even less soluble molecule, and that's called ureic acid. It's bigger, it's barely soluble, it actually kind of forms a bit of a powder, okay, and it's birds, reptiles, and insects that do this, okay? It's a big molecule, it's got a whole bunch of, of nitrogen that can be stored in it so they can get it out quickly, it's going to precipitate out a solution, so it's not going to harm the embryo in the egg makes a white dust on the inside of the egg. Adults still create nitrogen waste as a white paste. Okay, so they are the white paste that you see, what we call bird poop, is actually really much more bird pee, just in a more solid form because uric acid is solid. Okay, they don't really have a liquid waste. So uric acid is the white bird poop. And that, folks, is why most male birds don't have a penis, because they don't have to get rid of liquid waste, so they don't have to grow a larger structure specifically to get rid of um, nitrogenous waste. We'll talk about how birds still um, make babies later. Don't worry. Okay, um, before I go on to the mammalian system, let's think about the idea that 
mammals produce their embryos inside their bodies and they raise and develop those those embryos until they're ready to be born inside their bodies. So how is the body of the mother dealing with this extra nitrogenous waste? Well, remember, urea isn't as toxic. It doesn't transport across membranes as easily, but it still can. So as an embryo is growing inside of its mom, it's still producing nitrogenous waste and the embryo and then the fetus literally pees into mom, mm -hmm. pees right there into her uterus. It's a lovely thought. Um, and then mom, as, um, as mom's blood runs by baby's blood, and as mom's blood runs by all the embryonic fluid, um, the, the urea diffuses out of the baby's blood and diffuses out of the placental and embryonic fluid goes into mom's blood and then mom has to deal with that extra amount of urea and get that out faster. That's why pregnant women pee so much is because they're dealing with not only their own nitrogenous waste but also the fetus's nitrogenous waste. Lovely idea, huh? Okay, so mammalian system for getting actually getting rid of nitrogenous waste. Once you produce the urea in your cells, you've actually got to get it out of your body. So you've got a whole system set up to filter your blood, make sure you don't lose too much water, make sure you don't don't lose too many of your desirable solutes, your salts and your sugars and all those things that you need, but get rid of the stuff that you don't need. All right, so here's the things that your mammalian system does. It filters your blood, okay, filters stuff out of the blood, okay, then it's going to reabsorb the good stuff and it's going to selectively reabsorb just the things that you need. Then it's going to secrete out anything extra that's unwanted, make sure you're really getting rid of everything, and then you're going to actually excrete the final product, get rid of your concentrated urine from your body. That's going to be nitrogenous waste, extra solids you don't need, and then any toxins that might be in your body. Okay, so here is a picture of the, some pieces of the mammalian excretory system. I want to go to a video from the, text, the website that goes along with the textbook and show you a few things here. So let's go to this video. The excretory system controls the composition of body fluids by processing blood, regulating its water and solute content, and expelling waste. Use the pull-down menus to label this diagram of the human excretory system. All right, so we've got this picture of the human excretory system. And we want to try to figure out which parts do what. Okay, so we've got these two um, big brown bean-shaped things. So hopefully you've been able to figure out that those are the kidneys. So hopefully you got that. Um, then there are two um, blood vessels that come into, one that goes into and one that goes out of the kidneys. And they're going to bring the blood into the kidney and then take the filtered blood back out of the kidney. Okay, so those are going to be the renal artery and the renal vein. Okay, renal referring to the kidney system. Okay, then once the blood has been filtered and all your nitrogenous wastes are coming out, they're going to leave the kidney through this big huge tube and that is called the ureter. All the urine is going to be stored in this big um, sac-like organ, which is your bladder. And then it's going to leave your body through your urethra. So ureter and urethra are similar sounding. Ureter is the internal one. Urethra is what actually leads out. Okay, let's see what's next. The outer part of the kidney is called the cortex. Inside the cortex is the medulla. Urine collects in the renal pelvis and drains from the kidney through a tube called the ureter. Okay, so this is an internal slice looking at the inside of the kidney so that you can see the different parts. You see all these little red and blue spots? These are where um, capillaries coming out of the renal artery and going back into the renal vein are all located. We'll look at that more in a minute. The real activity of the kidney is carried out at the microscopic level in thousands of units called nephron. A nephron tubule and the blood vessels surrounding it have been straightened and simplified in this diagram. Use the pull-down menus to label the parts of the nephron. 
Okay, so this one is kind of confusing, but I think you either have this picture in your study guide or I will have made a, there should be copies of, for you of these pictures. So you want to fill it in as we go through so that you can figure out what's happening here. All right, so the blood comes into the kidney here and goes and is going to interact with this nephron here, the kind of yellowy brown parts of the parts of the kidney, and then you've got um, the blood vessels going around it. So this here is going to be a capillary, or it's going to be an arterial um, coming from the renal artery bringing blood into this whole system and it's going to come into this whole little ball of capillaries which has a fun name it's the glomerulus oops i must be pointing at the wrong thing sorry guys hang on okay oh there we go this one is pointing sorry this one is pointing to the glomerulus there we go and then this is oh this is the piece of capillary coming out of glomerulus arterial coming out of the glomerulus and then the actual part of the nephron that surrounds the glomerulus you've got this whole ball of capillaries and then a cup of um, nephron tissue that surrounds it that is called the Bowman's capsule okay so blood comes in and it's filtered here at the glomerulus and materials are going to move out of the blood and into the nephron and they're going to start moving through the nephron along this piece here and this piece here is going to be called the proximal tubule. Proximal meaning close to, distal meaning further from. So this is the one that's closest to the glomerulus. This is the one that's furthest, so this is the distal tubule. Okay, so the, um, the stuff that's come out of the blood, the liquid that's come out of the blood, we now call the filtrate. It's going to move down the proximal tubule, cross that, go down and around this loop here, and that's called the loop of Henle, after some person who helped figure out what it did, okay? And then the filtrate's going to move along the distal tubule, and then start moving down and out through this piece here, which is the collecting duct. And remember then all the collecting ducts from all the different nephrons all meet together at the renal pelvis and flow into the ureter. So there's your collecting duct. Okay, now let's look at the blood vessels again. We've got um, these capillaries that are going around the nephron. Those are called peritubular capillaries because they're going around the tubes. And then this blue piece heading out, that's leaving, so that's part of the renal vein because it's leaving the kidney. All right, so hopefully those different pieces make sense what they are. We're going to keep referring to them. A tiny branch of the renal artery carries blood to each nephron for processing. A tiny vein carries blood away. Blood pressure forces fluid through the walls of a cluster of capillaries called the glomerulus, and it collects in the cup-shaped Bowman's capsule. The filtrate is refined as it passes through the twisted nephron tubule. Useful substances are returned to the blood, and the remainder collects as urine. Refined urine is carried by the collecting duct into the renal pelvis for excretion from the body. Okay, we're going to keep looking that, at that in more detail. Back to our PowerPoint. Oops. Okay, so here it's going to kind of show you some more of these pieces, just to remind you um, what's happening where. Okay, so you want to make sure that you remember all these names. So remember, when you zoom in onto the kidney, you're going to see all these little, different little nephron structures. Here is the nephron, and one kidney has million has a million nephrons. Okay, it's going to filter things out of the blood. It's going to help um, reabsorb good things, and it's going to help get urine ready to get out of the body. So why does a nephron selectively reabsorb rather than selectively filtrate? Well, because it's easier to just kick everything out and then only let back in the few that you want, rather than sit there and be like, yeah, I like you, but no, I don't like you, and yeah, I like you, but no, I don't like you. It'd be much easier for me to say, all of you, get out, and then I just want you and you. Okay, so that's why it's selective reabsorption rather than selective filtration. Okay, it provides greater flexibility and control. All right, we'll talk about countercurrent in just a second. All right, so let's look at this mammalian kidney a little bit more. We want to know what's happening where. Remember that the um, kidney is filtering the blood. So there's got to be an interaction between the excretory system and the circulatory system. So the circulatory system brings blood in through um, from the renal artery 
and it comes into this whole ball of capillaries called the glomerulus. And basically everything that's in the blood that isn't blood proteins and blood cells is all going to get shoved out, okay? And then the part of the, of the um, excretory system is actually this nephron. So this, the kind of beige in this picture is different type of tissue from the blood, okay? It's got these different parts to it that we just talked about. All right, so how do these different things, different parts do different things? We're going to go back and watch another one of these videos. Nephrons regulate the composition of blood by a combination of three processes that transfer materials between the nephron tubules and the capillaries that serve them. Filtration, secretion, and reabsorption. A nephron tubule and the blood vessels surrounding it have been straightened and simplified in this diagram. The gradation of color, lighter on top, darker on the bottom, corresponds to an increasing concentration of solutes in the interstitial fluid surrounding the nephron toward the center of the kidney. As blood flows through the glomerulus, a knot of porous capillaries, Water and virtually all other molecules small enough are forced by blood pressure out of the glomerulus and into Bowman's capsule. This process is called filtration, and the fluid that accumulates in Bowman's capsule is called filtrate. Blood contains blood cells, plasma proteins, water, sodium chloride, hydrogen ions, bicarbonate ions, urea, glucose, amino acids, and possibly some drugs and poisons. Click on the two items on this list that you think are left behind in the blood when the blood is filtered because they're too big to pass through the pores in the glomerulus. All right, so looking at this list, the two biggest things are going to be blood cells and plasma proteins. Here we go. Blood cells and plasma proteins stay in the blood. They are just too big, but all the other substances are filtered from the blood and form the filtrate that accumulates in the nephron tubule. As the filtrate moves along the proximal tubule, certain substances are transported from the blood and added to the filtrate, a process called secretion. Secretion of hydrogen ions helps to regulate body pH. Certain poisons are also secreted to remove them from the blood. This list summarizes substances contained in the filtrate. Filtration is not selective, so some of these substances are useful to the body, and it is important that they be returned to the blood. Click on the substances that the body generally needs to recover from the filtrate. Okay, so what's going to still be useful to the body? Well, water, definitely. Salts are going to help you balance. Bicarbonate ions are going to help you keep balance. Glucose and amino acids. You're going to need all of those. The kidneys generally need to recover water, sodium chloride, bicarbonate ions, and nutrients such as glucose and amino acids. This reclamation of valuable solutes in water is called reabsorption. Okay. Let's look at the process of reabsorption as the filtrate continues its journey through the nephron tubule. In the proximal tubule, reabsorption of bicarbonate ions helps regulate the blood's pH. Sodium chloride, glucose, and amino acids are actively transported out of the filtrate. This leaves the filtrate more dilute than the surrounding interstitial fluid, so water follows by osmosis. These solutes and water re-enter the blood. So you see how the body is using basic osmosis, okay, which requires no energy to help maximize what's happening here, okay? So um, it's going to reabsorb bicarbonate and salt ions and these other solutes and because of that the blood's going to become have a high solute concentration and water's going to move by osmosis back into the blood okay let's see what's next as the filtrate moves down the loop of henley the concentration of solutes increases in the interstitial fluid surrounding the nephron tubule since this portion of the tubule is permeable to water Water leaves by osmosis and is reabsorbed into the blood. This concentrates the filtrate. In the ascending loop, the surrounding fluid becomes more dilute. This portion of the loop is impermeable to water, but not sodium chloride. 
sodium chloride diffuses out, lowering the solute concentration of the filtrate and adding to the solute concentration of the surrounding fluid. Near the top of the loop, sodium chloride is actively transported out, further diluting the filtrate. Okay, so as the filtrate moves down the loop of Henle, the loop of Henle has pores in it that allow water out. So since the surrounding fluid around the nephron gets increasing, increasingly more solute concentration, water is going to move out by osmosis. Remember, no energy going on here. And that's going to allow water to get back into the blood. Then as the loop of Henle goes back up, all the openings that will allow water through are all closed. None, there's nothing there. There's no way water's getting out. But then salts are able to move out, and actually up here, the filtrate, um, the body actually expends some ATP to actively transport salt out of the filtrate to make sure that there isn't too many salts lost from the body. More substances are reabsorbed from the distal tubule. Sodium chloride is actively transported out of the filtrate. Bicarbonate ions may be reabsorbed too helping to regulate body pH. Some drugs and poisons are secreted from the blood into the filtrate at this point. And this is another place where hydrogen ions may also be secreted into the filtrate to further adjust pH. There is a lot going on here. The main point is that the nephron is able to expel unneeded or harmful substances from the blood by filtration and secretion into the filtrate, and the nephron can reabsorb substances useful to the body. The filtrate enters the collecting duct. As it moves down the collecting duct, it passes through a region where the surrounding fluid has a higher and higher solute concentration. Water leaves the collecting duct by osmosis, concentrating the remaining filtrate into urine. Urea is one of the main body wastes in urine, but here some urea actually diffuses out of the filtrate. The urea performs a useful function by adding to the solute concentration of the interstitial fluid and causing even more water to be reabsorbed from the filtrate. Okay, so did you see water is going to diffuse out so that you don't lose too much water in your urine? And then you're also going to actually get rid of some urea into the space in your kidney so that um, the, content, the solute concentration stays really high inside your kidney so all this balanced stuff still works. Even though most of the water has been reabsorbed from the filtrate, urine is still 95% water. The most abundant solute is urea, along with other nitrogenous waste. There is some sodium chloride and traces of other ions such as calcium and potassium. Hydrogen ions make urine acidic, and drugs and toxins may also be present. Okay, let's go back to the PowerPoint and look at some of this stuff a little bit more closely. Okay, so what kinds of things are going to get come out of the blood? We just talked about this. It's going to be water glucose, salt and ions, and urea. But things that are going to stay in the blood are going to be the actual blood cells and then plasma proteins because they're all too big to come out. Now, what forces all these things out of the blood? Well, it's the high pressure. You've got these big um, blood vessels carrying in a bunch of blood, and then all of a sudden they're pushed into these itsy-bitsy little capillaries. And as you go from that big tube to those small tubes, it's going to increase the pressure. Okay? And that high pressure is going to force everything out. Well, what happens if you already have high blood pressure? Well, then you're upping it even more once it gets to the kidneys. So if the blood pressure in the body is too high, you actually can start exploding or blowing out these capillaries in the glomerulus. Okay? That's going to cause major kidney damage because your kidneys aren't going to be able to filter your blood as well, which means um, that you're going to basically be poisoning your body. High blood pressure is actually the number one cause of kidney damage in the this country. So if you have high blood pressure or anyone in your family does, remember that it is a serious thing. Okay, side note. All right, now what's happening once the filtrate has come out and is now moving along through the ne nephron, what's going to happen? All right, in the proximal tube, things are going to get reabsorbed back into the blood. Sodium chloride, and that's going to happen because sodium is going to be actively transported out of the filtrate, and since you've got those positives leaving, 
the negatives are going to follow by diffusion. Positives and negatives attract each other, so the negatives will follow by diffusion. Water is going to come out by osmosis because you, now you've gotten um, all these solutes back into the blood. Glucose is going to come out by carbonate ions. Okay, Bicarbonate ions are what help keep your blood pH where it needs to be, so that's why you need to keep those. Okay. Um, as you go down the, the descending loop of the limb of, loop of Henle, again, we said that it's got a high permeability to water, so there's a lot of aquaporins. Those are the openings that allow water to move through. So water is going to come out of the filtrate as much as possible, go back into the blood. However, there are very few sodium and chloride channels, so you're going to keep a lot of salts in the filtrate. Okay, So water gets reabsorbed. In the ascending loop, it's going to be the opposite. Okay, this, this section of the loop has a very low permeability to water, but it has a high permeability to sodium and chloride. So there are actually chloride pumps. You actively transport out chloride, and again, sodium is going to follow by diffusion. Okay, so in this section of the body of the nephron, your, your blood is reabsorbing salts. Okay, to help maintain the osmotic gradient within your body. You need to make sure that you have the right salt and water balance throughout your whole body. Okay, so the structure of the loop of Henle really allows for the function. This side allowing you to absorb water, this side allowing you to absorb salts. Amazing. Okay, then in the distal tube you're going to get some reabsorption of salts and waters, bicarbonate, the things that you might need. The collecting duct now is going to um, allow the body to reabsorb water as much as needed and is going to get rid of anything else that you might need to get rid of. Okay. So how is this whole process achieved? Like, How is everything so balanced that water can just move by osmosis where it needs to go? Well, the, really, the coolest thing about the kidney is that it uses something called counter current flow. And tight osmotic control is going to allow you to, for most things to move by diffusion and osmosis and very little energy be expended for actual active transport. Okay, Whenever possible, the kidney is using diffusion. And how does that happen? It happens because of counter current. All right, if you look here, notice that the blood comes in from the left and it goes across all the way to the right and then it goes down, around, and back out. Okay, whereas the filtrate comes in from the left, goes down on the left, up on the right and then out on the right. So you notice that the two systems are flowing in opposite direction to each other. We call that counter current exchange. All right, so how, how, why is that so important? That means that now the blood has gotten rid of all of its stuff, as much stuff as it could possibly get rid of at the very beginning. Now it's going to go over here to the end where the um, filtrate is now the least concentrated with stuff because the, the filtrate has gotten rid of all the things it needs to get rid of over here. So you've got low concentration and low concentration right next to each other. Okay. Then as the, as the blood starts picking up concentrations of salt and getting a higher and higher concentration back of salt, it's going to move back to the spots where the filtrate has the highest concentration of salt. But it, the blood should still be lower than the filtrate was. It helps make sure that the blood is always a lower number, a lower concentration of the things that are needed than the filtrate. Okay, Because if the blood went here, went from the glomerulus right to this beginning spot where the filtrate has its highest concentration of salts, well, the blood's going to absorb all of it. Okay, going to absorb like crazy and it's going to get to a high, high level. And then as it moves around and back over here, it's going to be so much higher than the filtrate or the urine that materials are actually going to start moving by osmosis back out of the blood and back into the urine, which is counterproductive. That is not what we want. So when they flow in opposite directions, you get the lowest concentrations in the water next to the lowest concentrations in the blood. So hopefully that makes sense. Okay, so things that are not filtered out of your blood. Cells and proteins. They stay in because they're too big. Things that are reabsorbed by active transport. Sodium, chloride, amino acids, and glucose. And the blood's going to reabsorb back as much glucose as it can. 
okay? If you have a lot of glucose in your body because your body's not handling your glucose well, meaning you have some form of diabetes, then there's still gonna be a high amount of glucose in your urine. And that's why the way we test to see if a person has diabetes in the first place is we look for sugar in the urine. If there's sugar in the urine, it means that the person has too much glucose in the body and they're not processing it correctly. Okay, things that are reabsorbed into the, um, into the blood by diffusion, um, some ions and some water. Okay, and the things that are gotten rid of, urea, excess water, excess solutes, there's your excess glucose, and then any other drugs, toxins, and unknowns. Okay. So one more thing that we want to talk about with kidney function is how does the body make sure overall that you don't lose too much water? Why is it that on a day when you're really, really hot and sweaty and thirsty, your urine looks different than on a day when you're really hydrated? Well, it's because of the fact that your body can control how much water is lost to your urine using hormones. So we're going to watch one more little video that talks about that. Hormones regulate water reabsorption by the nephron tubule in response to body fluid intake and loss. On a hot day, when you're sweaty and thirsty, blood solute concentration rises. In response, the brain signals the posterior pituitary to increase its output of the hormone ADH. ADH makes the walls of the collecting duct more permeable to water. Recall that the interstitial fluid surrounding the nephron tubule has a high solute concentration. ADH allows more water to leave the filtrate by osmosis and re-enter the blood. The body conserves water and concentrated urine is produced. Okay, so ADH stands for anti-diuretic hormone. A diuretic is something that causes you to lose water. So this hormone causes you to keep water. So it opens up aquaporins along the whole conducting collecting duct and because of this difference in concentration water is going to flow out of the urine by osmosis and back into the blood and that's why if you're dehydrated your urine is going to be more yellow in color. It's going to be more concentrated because there's less water in it. When you have been drinking more water and not losing much fluid the blood becomes more dilute the brain responds by decreasing the secretion of ADH. The collecting duct becomes less permeable and less water is reabsorbed. The body produces dilute urine. Okay, so when you have enough water in your blood, only a small amount of this hormone is going to be released. Only a few aquaporins on the collecting duct are going to be opened up. You'll absorb just a little bit of water, but you'll also lose a bunch of water through your urine, and that's because you have the water to spare. So when you're well hydrated, you'll notice that your water, that your urine, excuse me, is almost colorless, okay? So that's always a good way to know if you're feeling well or not, how your health is doing is by looking at your urine very yellow, you need to drink water. Nice and dilute, nice and colorless, you're doing good.